Hello, a very, very warm welcome to Chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita in this series entitled Gita Decoded. I, Magla Pillay, I'm interviewing Sister Denise for the purpose of attempting to understand the true message that the Bhagavad Gita contains. Many of you have already read the scripture probably numerous times. It is one of the most famous scriptures as far as Hinduism is concerned and it is found that the Bhagavad Gita is read by a few million people across the globe on a daily basis. In this series we're looking at why the Bhagavad Gita is so important and very crucially how it can help you uh, ameliorate the quality of your life and also improve your relationship with God. To this end, I'd like to welcome Sister Denise. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to this episode, Sister Denise. We're going to look at the Yoga of Action, Chapter 3. Uh, at the beginning of this chapter, we find that uh, Arjuna has not lost all of his torment or confusion. And this chapter begins by him asking Krishna, um, if it is your conviction that knowledge is better than action, O Krishna, then why do you urge me to engage in this terrible action? So there's this confusion that's still in his mind. And um, the answer that he receives is um, noteworthy. It is found in verse 3. And it reads, The Blessed Lord spoke, In this world there is a twofold ba basis of devotion, taught since ancient times by me, O Arjuna, that of knowledge, the yoga of the followers of Sankhya, and that of action, the yoga of the yogins. Sister Denise, how do you um, understand these two terminologies or phrases? And um, as we do with every single word that we look at in the Bhagavad Gita, how do you apply it in your daily life? Well, let me also begin by focusing on the description that Krishna gives to himself that I have been teaching this through the ages. Mm. Uh, that means that it is something that comes up from time to time through the eons of time and every so often human beings, humanity finds itself in this situation and there is this encounter between God and people. There's the yoga of knowledge which is clearly the most elevated but it's out of range for many many because it is so different from what people normally think of as right way to do things. As you said before people really don't want to be, they want to do. So then the thing is okay what should I be doing? How should I be doing it? Why should I do it? It's all about action. And of course, karma is action. And everything that happens to us, everything we do, the whole thing is because of and about our karma. Those people who are called the yogins and the karma yogis have to act in remembrance of God. They have to act following the directions of God so that their action then becomes the most elevated action and it puts the person into uh, profit. Where what does that mean, Denise? Profit? Profit means that you, every time you do an action it either puts you into profit or loss. So if it's a good karma, it puts you into profit. If it's a bad karma, it puts you into loss. So the whole thing of karma is its uh, calculation. You compare that with the Sankhya, the yoga of knowledge, the sage, he doesn't have to do anything. So he's much more like God. God doesn't do anything. God is called Akarta, Asojta, Abogta. He doesn't do anything, he doesn't think, and nothing happens to him. That is a truly divine state. And what he wants, I would say, is for Arjuna to become like that. But he can't get him to become like that until he understands many, many things. So in order for Arjuna to get to that point, he has to kind of go back to basics, which means, okay, now you have to understand about action. But the final goal is presented right at the beginning of the Gita, 
which we'll see later at the end of the Gita, he does actually attain. And I think it's a very interesting way that God presents the study. You know, what you're trying to reach is blissful union with me. For that you need to understand it, but before you can understand it, you have to start, you know, baby steps, which is the action. So I, I think it's really uh, telling us that. Now, Sister Denise, I note that the question that Arjuna poses to Krishna is, how should I attain the highest good? So the um, reason that God discloses all of this to Arjuna is because he sees in Arjuna a hunger to be a not a better man, but a highly spiritually evolved man. Is this the level of... Um, well, I'm going to use the word passion, for um, truth that one needs to attain what God is describing in the Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, I think so. And I think if you don't, if it isn't a passion with you, um, you won't do it because you need that energy or that passion to get through there. But then when he talks about this kind of passion is a positive passion, and then there's other kinds of passions, negative passions of anger and lust and that, uh, that destroys you. You know, it's fire. Fire is good for cooking, it's also good for forest fires. <laughs> yes, yes. So passion is fire. Verse 4 contains a warning, which states, Not by abstention from actions does a man attain the state beyond karma. And yet, Sister Denise, the world is um, rather filled with people who believe that one can abstain from action. Why is this belief so deep? Uh, I see the Hindi word that's used is a karma. Could you yes. explain that for us? You have a tradition in India which is the sannyasins, and very often it will be called karma sannyas. The idea that karma is negative. In um, the Raj Yoga practice that we do in Brahma Kumaris, we talk of three kinds of karma, sukarma, akarma, and vikarma. So vikarma is negative action, sukarma is positive action. Sometimes we call it punya, the very powerful charity that um, puts a person into extreme profit which enables the person to achieve great achievements through powerful karma. And then you have our karma, which is generally translated as non-action or inaction. Now in uh, Raj Yoga, as we practice it in Brahma Kumaris, that is called neutral action. A neutral action, in terms of the calculation of karma, has to be seen within that context. So. When you start your spiritual practice, you start with a very, very heavy debt on your head. And because of that debt, you need to do some powerfully pure karma to start reducing that debt. Now, how that debt got there in the first place is because you did negative karma. And that um, tendency to do negative karma is still there. So you have to resist the negative karma. You have to perform pure karma so that your state of debt goes to a state of where that, where that debt is finished. Because the laws of karma want e everything to be equal, want your banker balance to be in profit. And before it goes from debt to profit, you have to pass by the zero stage. Our karma is the action that you do, which is very pure, but which is not required to bring you out of debt. Our karma is not non-action, it's pure action which is unnecessary, but it's just there because you're that kind of person. And in the same way for, for God, it is said that he doesn't do anything. Actually, God does act, but he doesn't need to act for himself because he doesn't ever become deficient. So these ideas are very much there in uh, Brahma Kumari's form of Raj Yoga, but you don't normally find that in the traditional 
interpretation of karma, usually people think that our karma means not to act. And so the sannyasis believe that all of the activity that goes on in the household is negative karma. And so they avoid that by going away into the forest where they engage in karma sannyas. But Shiv Baba tells us that actually it is uh, maybe um, not quite the right interpretation of the laws of karma because if you do not do those actions that you're responsible for to look after yourself, then somebody else has to do that and you become indebted to them, which means that you have defeated your purpose by not understanding the meaning of karma a karma vi karma. And another interesting angle on it is that the person who leaves the home and family goes to the forest as a karma sannyasi has done an additional negative karma of failing to provide for his wife and children, which puts him in debt to them. So in the name of getting free from the bondage of karma, they actually get in further bondage of karma because of not understanding that angle on it. So this is something we, we learn about, which also refers to another question you gave earlier, and that is, how can you do this while living in the world as we know it. We have to live in the world as we know it because otherwise we incur debt by failing to fulfill our responsibilities. So Sister Denise, the second part of that stanza reads, and not by renunciation alone does man approach perfection. Renunciation of what? There is the image of the Trimurti, where you have Brahma, Vishnu, Shankar. Now, of the three also refer to the three kinds of effort that are needed. Um, as a Brahmin, child of Brahma, you need to absorb pure wisdom. You need to study, you need to do that action. The Shankar stage refers to renunciation of negative karma. So you have to add positive, you have to subtract negative, and then what you end up with is the Vishnu stage, which is the sustainer, and this is the one who will be able to continue on um, persisting in uh, righteousness for a long, long period of time. If you just give up, you see, you become dry. And as I was mentioning earlier, you know, just giving up all the desires is like, okay, then what do you get? Now, when you go for the bliss of God, then your feeling of giving up is that you haven't given up anything because look at what you're getting. You don't feel that there's been any renunciation. Otherwise, if you're just a renunciate, you become aware of all the things you don't have and then you're still in the desire. I found it very interesting that the next stanza deals with hypocrisy, mm. okay, which makes one want to, <coughs> is the reaction that you have. So, um, he who sits restraining his organs of action while in his mind brooding over the objects of the senses um, with a deluded mind is said to be a hypocrite. This is very bitter medicine. And Sister Denise, the reason I say so is because um, if somebody makes a decision that he will not lose his temper with his um, five-year-old child and uh, yet when the five-year-old behaves in an abominable manner then he will feel angry but not express it because of his decision but um, there will still be anger in the mind so um, my sympathy is for this person who's just been described because we have all been there. You want to be... Uh, but I, I don't think that example applies to the father who's trying not to get angry with his abominably behaving child. It's something else. It's the person who says, I'm a celibate. And he's fantasizing erotic fantasies in his head. That's what it's referring to. That's the hypocrisy. Because you're living in this body, 
Okay, there are certain desires that emerge because you're in this body and you've made a decision, a celibate person has made a decision that they won't act in a certain manner uh, and yet the desires still emerge in the mind. And so um, what if he finds it difficult to control those desires? Of course uh, he finds it difficult to control <laughs> Yes, so, so here's my point. I sympathize with the hypocrite. Okay, because, Sister Denise, there is a hypocrisy in all of us. Every single weakness that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, we all have it. The question is, to what degree? I'm not saying it's justifiable, okay? But my question is, how do you absolve yourself from this sin? I, I think it's really not quite even how do you absolve yourself from the sin. The thing is this, okay, if you say, okay, I'm going to do this spiritual practice, I'm up for it, etc. But you do not do the yoga. That is when your desires will get the better of you. If you maintain the yoga, you'll be fine. But okay, if you so don't maintain it, you won't. Okay, so what you're saying is, if a person chooses to be what the Bhagavad Gita says you should be, okay, you not only have to leave behind all the weaknesses mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, together with that, you've got to connect with God. And the twofold action brings you into a state of what? Internal honesty. I think it goes back to not something proscriptive the way you have described it, but it's really, you know, a person says, okay, I choose to do this. And then next sentence, I'm claiming that I am doing it, but they're not doing it. Because what you're doing is the practice of yoga. You're not doing restraint of desire, you're doing practice of yoga, which causes a physical desires to become calmed. But if you claim that I am a yogi but you're not doing yoga that's what's hypocritical when it comes to the relationship between anger violence and lust they are in in spiritual practice they are put together very closely because what happens traditionally is when a person decides they're going to restrain their sexuality it takes the form of violence when you do it by force. If you want to restrain your sexuality through communion with God, then it doesn't translate into anger. But your anger is calmed, your lust is calmed, all your other vices are calmed. You see, this is the difference between doing something by hatha or doing something by Raja Yoga. Hmm. And, and a lot of people, sad to say or whatever, but the quality of effort will slip into a repression instead of yoga. And that is what puts them into the hypocritical condition. Uh, Sister Denise, for somebody who engages on this level of effort, Okay, uh, suppression and repression is something that he will have to encounter at some stage or the other. Is it not the case that mm, whomsoever embarks on a spiritual journey suppresses or represses certain aspects of the personality from one time, at one point in time or the other, albeit temporarily? Okay, they will do that, but very quickly they will find out it doesn't work, you see. Mm. And then I think if they are sincere, mm and they really want to achieve this bliss mm. of uh, mm. the communication mm. with God, mm. then as you mentioned earlier, they're going to have to be brutally honest with themselves and say, okay, do you really want this? And if you do really want this, then this is the price, you see. And the price is that you can't fool around. You have to really do the practice. And just pretending to an impressed audience doesn't do it, doesn't work. Mm. You see, because hypocrisy means you're pretending, doesn't it? 
Um, we'll take this up later mm. because um, God addresses this yeah. um, head on to Arjuna. He who undertakes the control of the senses by the mind, Arjuna, and without attachment, engages the organs of action in the yoga of action is superior. That's quite a mouthful. Um, what has been your experience of this? Well, he uses the word karma indriya, right? Karma indriya is the organs of action, the eyes, the ears, etc., etc. When you're in yoga, you shift through your through your mind through your understanding you shift to a different frequency people operate on a certain frequency like you can check it with an oscilloscope to some extent now when you practice yoga and you're going into spiritual consciousness you're going on to the dimension of the spirit the world of that is not the material world through the uh, focused attention of the mind through deep understanding with the intellect, you can bring yourself to that level and uh, you change the atmosphere, you change everything, but it is very, very subtle. And this is why in the second chapter is talking about being, because this is really about being. Now then when you say, okay, well that's too difficult, okay, now go to action it isn't that much less difficult it may be more um, tangible mm. because you're saying okay i choose to restrain my organs whereas at the level of being you're restraining yourself at an earlier level than when the energy gets as far as the organs so in that sense it's much easier because the organs don't even have to be restrained because you're already bringing yourself to a different space. If you say, okay, I can't do that, I have to do it on the organs, you're more into matter and you're trying to overcome matter, you're, you're likely to try and use force, very likely. So then you have to do it in very loving, very uh, disciplined, very correct way. But you're still much more out there than in the previous chapter where you're really inside being the soul. On that level is much easier, but if people find it too difficult, then they have to do it on the other level. Mr. Denise, I see that um, throughout chapter 3, one hears the message that Sri Krishna is sharing with Arjuna as to not just what to do but the consciousness mm -hmm. of action and this is uh, spiritually extremely significant. Most of us in the ordinary course of life uh, don't really look at our motives. We do what we want to do with whomever we want to do with, however we want to do it and uh, very few stop and say what is the karma of what I'm about to do? What, what is the consequence? We, we don't actually do that practically. So could you tell us how consciousness plays a part in um, our behavior? Because the message that um, I received from this chapter is it's not just about what you do, but uh, what's behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, your motivation. And always go back to the idea, okay, I'm a person and I choose to engage in a spiritual practice whose um, consequence is that I reach a higher level of consciousness, you know. So that means I have to be thinking about what is my motive, what is my consciousness, why am I doing this? and I have to give myself answers to that question. Otherwise, I'm like a blind person or a, a, a person like it was in that earlier um, a stanza. The people who are awake to that which yogis are asleep, you know, you're back there again. Uh, the thing is with the spiritual practice, there's always slipping back and recidivism and going back to the, um, the hedonistic state, you see, because to change the 
human nature, that's a big thing. Of course you're going to slip back. If you ask yourself, why am I doing this? What are the karmic consequences? And this reflection on your action is just so important. Okay, Sister Denise, I think that we'll have to say goodbye to you for now. We haven't come to the end of Chapter 3 uh, because it's, um, it may be a short chapter, but it has quite a lot of depth, and so we will take the subject up in, an, in a forthcoming episode. Uh, there you have it. Sister Denise has shared what um, God has meant by his words to Arjuna, that action is important, the type of action is important, and the consciousness behind your action um, is something that you should also be, be um, of importance to you, something that you should be paying attention to. Uh, we also looked at the issues of suppression and repression, which is um, unfortunately part of the um, difficulties that one experiences when embarking on such a high destination. So Sister Denise, thank you so much for what you shared just now. Thank and um, we will see you again for the next episode. Thank you and goodbye.